are going to get started. Um, it's good to see so many of you here for today's Lunch and Learn. Today we have Dolly Sullivan, all right? Yeah. Dolly Sullivan will be presenting today on um, opioid treatment, opioid treatment in West Virginia. and going to talk about the COAT model um, specifically, and we're very excited to have her here. Um, I'll let her, some of you have seen her before, if you have heard our previous Lunch and Learn on building a private practice, for those of you Maybe you so I'll let you just introduce yourself and say a quick little bit about yourself sure. and then we'll get started. Just a couple of business things. If you haven't been here before, we always ask that you sign in and the sign-in sheet and that you complete an evaluation form and just bring it up at the end. Okay. I'll let you take it away. All right. Thanks. Hi everybody. Good to be back. Good to see some familiar faces. We're still gonna have a again. Um, thanks for that. I am uh, really happy to be here. I should be accompanied by my husband, but he was not able to come today. Uh, I wanted him to come with me because it's his model that I'm going to be talking about. He's a physician that founded what's known as the West Virginia Model for Opioid Addiction Treatment. And uh, I think I mentioned in the past that he had had a massive stroke a couple of years ago. It was two years ago last week. But uh, he's doing really well, but he was affected with aphasia, so it did, did affect his speech. But he likes to keep me honest and attend these things with me because I can see the PowerPoint. Um, which I love my thumb drive and my computer, incidentally, just down the street. But um, uh, so he always corrects me if I speak out of turn. But uh, we're actually heading to Cleveland Clinic after this, so he decided to just chill. Uh, so um, I'm sorry he couldn't be here. Uh, if we do this again at some point, he'll. Talk together uh, twice now, and we'll do it again next month for another class. So, anyway, so I'm sorry you didn't get to meet him, but maybe someday. Uh, so, I wanted to talk to you all about uh, a topic that is really kind of at the forefront of public health issues, uh, which is the opioid epidemic. Uh, truth is, uh, I'll give you a little history about how the epidemic started, and tell you a couple of books that would be worth reading if you're interested. Um, in the epidemic, if you're interested in the practice of uh, treating addiction, and um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about that piece so you can understand how we, how this came about, um, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what West Virginia is doing to uh, one of the ways West Virginia is treating uh, or tackling trying to tackle the opioid epidemic through the COPE model. And COAT meaning C O A T, uh, which stands for Comprehensive Opioid Addiction Treatment, uh, and that's the, and we named it that way because we wanted to really point out the fact that it was comprehensive, and I'll go into that in just a little bit. Um, how many of you are familiar with um, the epidemic? How how many of you are familiar with the disease of addiction? Um, whether it's through work, personal experience, whatnot. Okay. And um, how many of you have been actively involved in working with people at a professional level with that are struggling with this addiction? Two of you. Okay. Um, so feel free to chime in. I'm very interested in hearing about your experiences as well. But also feel free to chime in on questions too, because I know there's a lot of questions about um, the epidemic itself, but also questions about, you know, why medication is the treatment. So, unfortunately, I don't have a PowerPoint, sorry, literally just grabbed this off my printer. And anyway, so, uh, my husband's name is uh, Dr. Carl Sullivan, but he goes by Raleigh. Um, and Raleigh uh, has been at the Department of Behavioral Medicine and Psychiatry at WVU um, since uh, 1980, if I remember correctly, 80, 81. And he, uh, over time, had served in different roles administratively at um, behavioral medicine. But then uh, as things started to grow and change with regards to addiction, um, he uh, found his way towards uh, the director of addiction medicine in, in the Department of Behavioral Medicine. And at the time when he was working um, 
in the addiction unit or section, I guess you could say, in 1981, the way that they approached addiction was the inpatient 28-day, uh, what's called as what's known as the Minnesota model, um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, a group of physicians and staff came up with uh, a model for a 28-day program, so to speak, and that was the uh, that was the model. They spent a lot of time there in Minnesota, incidentally, learning and whatnot. And so they adopted that model in the 80s, and um, in the early 90s. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the history of managed care, but it's in the 1990s when managed care started to uh, take hold of our uh, healthcare system and the way we operate and the way we don't operate and so on and so forth. Prior to the 90s, when managed care reared its head, um, prior to that, it was not difficult for people to get treatment for addiction. Right? It was, at that time, it was primarily alcohol, alcoholism for the most part, but it was not difficult to, to get help for addiction at that time. Um, and it wasn't um, difficult to get inpatient or outpatient treatment. But then when managed care reared its head and decided it was the best way to, um, to, to operationalize healthcare services, um, it effectively was the, the death of inpatient treatment for West Virginia. Okay, and so at that point in the early 90s, after uh, managed care took hold. There was virtually no residential beds uh, for addiction in the state, and that's pretty much when it ended. And there were no day programs for substance abuse treatment either uh, for years. And um, so in 1991, they did build uh, an addiction intensive outpatient program after a lot of fighting and finagling. Um, and then in the late 90s uh, is when Raleigh was predicting the opioid epidemic. And back then, it wasn't that people laughed at him. It was just they thought he was really naive. Because what had happened was a huge turning point, among other things. But this was a real turning point in, um, in what led to the epidemic. And in the 90s, if you were to look back in the archives, you would find a Time Life magazine. But on the front of it, on the cover of Time, there was a physician with a stethoscope around his neck and his white coat. And it said, doctors don't treat pain. And so it basically was an article that talked about how, you know, there are new medications on the market that have been approved by the FDA um, that doctors are reluctant to use. And uh, now that we have them, why aren't we using them? Well, the physicians were fearful that there was an addictive component to the medication. But the pharmaceutical company said there absolutely is not. And so at that point, with this really kind of lambasting article um, about physicians and their, and their unwillingness to treat pain, we know anything about pain. We know that pain, chronic pain, really leads to a lot of problems. A, whatever you're healing from, you don't heal. B, depression is not far behind. Um, and all of the other things in between. And so for them to have kind of acquired that reputation at a time when there were medications on the market that were supposed to address these things, and with the guarantee that there was no addictive component to these medications, they started to treat pain. And so effectively, my husband always said, so pain ended up becoming the fifth vital sign, you know? And so if, you, if you've been in the hospital or you've had loved ones in the hospital that come in, nurses come in during shift change or every so often, they check your pulse, they check your blood pressure, they check your temperature, they check all of your stats, and then what did they start doing? They would ask you if you're in pain and to rate your pain on a scale of one to 10, or zero to 10. And that became a part of their final sign check. And so um, that was a big, big reason for the start of the epidemic, and um, among other things too, but that, uh, just for the sake of history, is a tidbit worth knowing. Um, uh, at that point in the 90s, in the late 90s, all 
they had at the time to treat opioid addiction was methadone. And, you know, there's pros and cons to that, um, but you also have to remember that at the time, and still today, a lot of folks who choose methadone as a, as a way to treat opioid addiction also don't uh, provide comprehensive care. And so while, and, and we'll talk more about what that means and looks like in a minute, and so it also became a marketable cash cow for physicians that weren't terribly scrupulous. And um, uh, so there was talk about a medication known as buprenorphine. You all know it as Suboxone. It is not Suboxone. It hasn't been Suboxone for quite a long time, but people know it as Suboxone, but it is buprenorphine. And there was talk about buprenorphine being studied for approval by the FDA. And at that time, Raleigh was treating mostly uh, alcoholics. I mean, that was the, the major component, like that was the biggest volume of his, of his patients that were struggling with addiction. And, um, but then like as the 90s are, you know, as the 90s come and pass by 2000, he, it was basically that statistic was on its head where he was at, 90% opioid addicts, 10% alcoholics. And uh, so he really came to see opioid addiction as a hopeless disease and that it was just not treatable. Um, and, not, and I should have said this in the beginning so that you also understand just how he and his team approach addiction. It's important that you understand that, that um, he was coming at this from a chronic disease model, seeing addiction as a chronic disease. So <clears throat> he was a lot of the time tackling it at a, at, from a medical model, of course. But you know, he always had come to see addiction as, as a disease of the brain, and that you know, with the right treatment for certain addictions, you know, you could recover from that. But it didn't necessarily have to be. A life sentence, but with the opioids, yeah, he really did start to see it as a life sentence because his patients were dropping like flies. I mean, they were just dying left and right. And, and still today, he'll see former patients in the paper, their obituaries, and so on and so forth. And they'll just point them out and be like, "There's no better patient now," you know. So he just really came to feel like, okay, there's there's really no way for me to tackle this. Um, but by 2002, buprenorphine. Um, also known as Suboxone, was uh, approved by the FDA as a means to treat opioid addiction. So by January of 2003, once it was full-fledged on the market and all those billing questions were answered and so on and so forth, they started uh, to treat patients with buprenorphine. Uh, January of 2003 to September of 2003, they treated it from a detox approach only, so basically a 28-day model. And over the course of January to September, his patients were still dying. Okay, because you have to realize that, you know, while 28 day models can and do work for some, from an opioid addiction standpoint, based on the, the nature of the addiction, um, you know, it was basically clean them up, send them home in the exact same environment. Uh, with minor level of tools for coping and so on and so forth. And so he was still seeing more and more of his, of his patients die. And so he just felt like there has to be a different way. But because while they were in there, <clears throat> they responded so well. They just responded so well. And there was just such high hopes for, for it being a good drug, you know, and then when people were continuing to, to die, he was just that dumb. He really needed to, to figure out a different way. And so by, by September 2003, he uh, called his first patient on medication-assisted treatment, Natalie, which is his daughter's name, but for the sake of anonymity, his uh, first patient on MAT, medication-assisted treatment, that was ongoing. He saw her one-on-one. -on -one. She soared. He saw her one on one and made sure that she was getting therapy at the same time. And when he saw how 
well she thrived just in an outpatient setting with therapy, he was like, well, this is the way we have to do it. Like, you know, I'm really not the treatment. The therapy is the treatment. Okay. And so by late uh, 2003, they started their youth morphine clinic known as the Coke model. You know, Raleigh is a big believer that medication is, is not enough. And it isn't. Um, he would he'll always tell you, when he's ever able to do these talks again, he would always tell you that he is not the treatment. He makes treatment possible. Him as a physician who has the ability to write prescriptions for buprenorphine make the treatment possible because the nature of the chemistry of the drug, it removed all of the cravings. And so for the first time, people were feeling normal. Okay, and so um, he was just a firm believer that the, the, medic, the, the medical component was the least of in terms of sustainable recovery. And so he always approached addiction from a biopsychosocial standpoint. There are biological reasons why people end up becoming addicted to something. There are psychological reasons for it. I mean, how many people do you know that struggle now with the disease of addiction, which I believe is a chronic disease, no different than high blood pressure or diabetes? <clears throat> how many people do you know, from a psychological standpoint, turn to substances as a means to self-treat? You know, so, and then you've got the environmental social component, you know, how many people do you know or how many stories have you heard of people who struggle with the disease of addiction themselves and grew up in it? You know, everybody in their family, you know, or their closest friends turned to it. So they got curious. So they tried. So do you see? So there's just, it, 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 it's not any one thing. It's a compilation of things. And no matter what actually caused or started your addiction that altered your brain like so, isn't, you know, no matter what that is, it is still the rest of it, right, that's affected. You know, people lose their jobs, people lose their marriages, people lose their children, people lose their homes, people, you know, so it's just, it's it's a pervasive problem. And so, that, you know, it's not necessarily about the one thing, because it's people, places, and things. It's biology, it's psychology, it's all of it. Um, so, uh, he always, and, and then after he saw how well Natalie was doing with this one-on-one -on -one hand therapy approach, then he felt like, okay, this like this has to constantly be tied together, no exceptions. Like you, you know, there is no treatment without therapy. You know, without therapy, you're staying out of withdrawal, and that's not recovery, right? So, um, so then after. Um, seeing how well Natalie was doing, he tried to pull a team together, like a, basically a, a multidisciplinary team together, and wanted to trial a group, uh, a group of 8 to 12. And um, so basically what they did is they pulled together everybody that would be involved in that person's care throughout the building, okay, and created a multidisciplinary team that cared for these people struggling with addiction. And so they would meet together once a week, or like on the day of their group meetings when the patients came in. They would get together and powwow. So there were social workers, there were nurses, there were physicians assistants, there were care managers, there were physicians, residents. I mean, like, so there was just a whole team that really got to know these people inside and out. And they would powwow about this group one by one. They would run the list. And then, once they were done, then they went into another room where the patients were in a kind of more of a group therapy setting. And Raleigh would just start one by one. And for 30 minutes, he went around the room to check in with everyone. And um, it was a very structured environment. It was a very, I mean, it was just a well-oiled machine and he would check in with every patient and ask them how their week was, ask them how their symptoms were, ask them if they were clean, if they were clean, who got to stay, if, if they also did random 
drug screens. So if they said they were clean and their urine test came back positive for anything, um, much less, you know, they all, not only were they testing to see if there was any alcohol or other drugs, because the goal was to keep them away from alcohol and other drugs as well, but they were also looking to see if they had buprenorphine in their system, because if they didn't, then it meant that they were selling it instead of taking it, right? So either way, you were gonna get kicked out if you lied. If you told the truth and said, no, I'm not clean, you get to stay because relapse is a part of the story. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges that those of us who work with people who struggle with the, with the disease of addiction, I really think that we, we struggle with that idea with that concept and it really kind of it really can get to us if we don't do a regular self-check on our kind of boundaries about our own like personal opinions about people and addiction and relapse and this and the other because it can be really frustrating because if relapse is a part of recovery then it's like what are we doing well we're, we're helping this person recover and they're going to relapse and as long as they're honest with you about it you can go somewhere with that it's when they're lying to you that you can't go anywhere with that. So if he lied, he would boot you out for 30 days. And then it was really more than that because over time there was a, a wait list that grew. And so it became increasingly difficult for people to um, get back in. Um, but his his philosophy was, I have a wait list that's now over 600 people there at Chestnut Bridge right now. And I can't hold your spot if you're gonna lie to me. You know, like I can't, like people need help and people are ready and maybe you're not, you know. And so the whole idea was to provide as much structure as possible, being mindful of uh, the logistics, the cost, the reimbursement issues, so on and so forth. But it was tricky trying to get everything approved in a way that the, it, they were billing basically for a medical evaluation with a doctor and they were billing for therapy. <coughs> so that was kind of tricky from a utilization management standpoint. And getting all of that squared away to ensure that people's insurances were going to pay. So that took time in and of itself just to get the model kind of approved from a are you going to pay at six point. And um, <clears throat> so once he would get through the whole group, he would kind of check in, in with them from a biopsychosocial standpoint. Then once that group process, the, the kind of med check process was done, then they would, and that would allow him to know whether he needed to adjust, adjust dosages or get more, get less, so on and so forth. And just really be a cheerleader. I mean, he was just a real, you know, cheerleader. Like this, like it's truly one day at a time and it's hard and awful and, you know, you hate me and I understand that. And you're gonna, you know, and, and he was just um, uh, very open to the, to the negativity that tends to happen when people first start the process. It kind of gets worse before it gets better, if that makes sense. So also, so once the group left the, the medicine check and the biopsychosocial check, then the whole group moved to a different room and they had group therapy. And during that time was when they really dealt with the people, places, and things and really dealt with coping mechanisms and stress management and you know, and it was a really powerful, it is a really powerful process because, you know, you have a group of people that are struggling with the same thing, different stressors, same disease, and it really offered an opportunity for them to hold each other accountable and for them to keep each other motivated and for them to support each other through that. And um, uh, so then they would do that for an hour. And so all told, it was a 90 minute um, investment of time. And the patients did not receive their prescription for the next week until they left therapy. So it's not like they were handing out prescriptions. Okay, we'll see you later, go ahead and go to therapy. And some people who really aren't ready to be in therapy would just walk out the door. So, so they, you, you, you don't get your prescriptions you've attended your therapy session. The other rules about it is, is that you also have to have to attend 12-step um, program. So depending on where you were at in your recovery, um, you they require you to attend anywhere between one 
12, 4, 8, depending on your situation and how good you're doing or how bad you're struggling, determine how many um, AA or NA groups you had to attend that week. And everybody, even, uh, you know, groups across the state, because people were driving from Logan, which is three and a half hours from here, to come to COVID Clinic. And people still do that today, although the COVID model is growing into different parts of the state, which is a good thing. But just to give you an idea, like people were coming up here once a week, you know, uh, for that treatment. And so it became a known requirement at groups. And so they were really good about telling us if people weren't there and, you know, um, they have to sign off signature pages and then over time it became very easy to know when people were forging signatures and so on and so forth and that would get you kicked out too and um so uh the 12 step program being formidable part of the process if you don't go you don't get to stay um and there's even online groups now we had a lot of people uh that struggle either from a transportation standpoint or from a you know medical standpoint, maybe they've just had issues that they can't go that often or whatnot, and so there are online groups now too. So that has certainly made um, life a little easier for folks who to get to those programs. And the goal, again, is abstinence from alcohol and drugs as well. Um, the intakes are done by social work faculty, staff, students. Um, uh, they really uh, hope to give the person of buprenorphine at the time of the intake if possible because they um, are desperate for relief, and that gives them the relief. Again, like he always says, like the, the, the medication is what makes treatment possible. And so if they can see the relief that they get, it usually creates buy-in and they come back. You know, um, all patients come weekly until they're 90 days clean, sober. And if they relapse, then it starts over. Um, each visit consists of a 30-minute medical group, 60-minute psychoeducation group, random UBS, like I said, 12-step meeting list review. <clears throat> they have now intermediate groups where you're 90 to 365 days sober, and if you reach the intermediate group, then you go bi-weekly, come weekly. There's the advanced group where you have a year plus, and you only go then monthly. And there's a relapse prevention group <clears throat> Um, for those who just really are having multiple relapses and multiple relapses and multiple relapses, but they have less than 90 days clean on a repeated basis, and so then they try to keep um, uh, just a higher watch on them, and they would go weekly. At the time of this PowerPoint, which is 2015, there were 40 groups per week of 8 to 12, um, or 10 to 12. And at that time in 2015, there were three telemedicine people North Bank clinics. Now that has grown. I can't remember what the number is now, but I can tell you that they have now over 500 patients in the COVID program with the waiting list of um, last year, the waiting list was 600 and some. I'm hopeful that that's changed because <clears throat> um, we have more folks doing it throughout the state. Um, any questions? So far, some of this is redundant to what I've already said. I have a quick question. Yeah. Do, you, do they require individual therapy as well, or just the group? So about four or five years ago now, um, or maybe four, three or four years ago now, if I think about it, Medicare and Medicaid did say that they were going to require individual therapy or not pay for it. And so that really wrecked a program like this because they were already at a staff maximum to treat them the way they were getting treated. And what they had done at the time, prior to that regulation, they had made in individual therapy an option for those who could make it happen, you know, both from an insurance standpoint and just time investment standpoint. Um, and so several did. And of course it was stronger. You know, I mean, of course, you know, getting some more of that one-on-one -on -one was just, I mean, I don't know if there's ever too much treatment trying to recover from addiction. So, um, but when that regulation came down, they really had to scurry and, you know, did a lot of policy advocating as well by saying, like, listen, like this, this could really change the nature of things swiftly and put a lot of people in trouble, you know? And so uh, I think they ended up 
changing things a little bit, if I remember right, to, it didn't have to be weekly, they, that they could go monthly, if I remember correctly. Don't, don't quote me on that. I can ask Raleigh about that if I get home, but, um, and get back to you to be sure. But, um, but yeah, they did mandate that piece, and so they scurried, and I mean, they, they made it work, but, you know, it made the therapists that were in those groups, they had to offset their her, their outpatient clients to other therapists who right. were already full. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So that they could take them in from an right. individual standpoint. So it was just administratively just a real nightmare. Yeah. Any other questions? growing it is in Charleston now uh, the first pilot uh, because that's what Raleigh kept saying you know Raleigh was just big on like we have to build capacity throughout the state like West Virginia University is not the be all end all and we are not going to meet the need on by ourselves like you know people there are really good practitioners out there at the physician and clinician level that want the, to, to, to know how to treat people who struggle with addiction and so let's teach them you know and so it was um the last two years um before raleigh stroke so that was 2015 15 14. In 2014 he went to cabin creek you know where that is and he went to cabin creek and said let's pilot let's let's find one organization that's really on fire about this and pilot this and i will consult them our our team will consult them and um, so that was their first pilot test. And um, he went down there three times to kind of go through. Well, he had them, he had their team come up here and observe and just see the process so that they could believe they could do it. Like, this is doable, you know. And then he went down there three times and just kind of worked with them, coached them, you know. And then from that point on, weekly, they had um, consultation sessions as a team a multidisciplinary team um, by satellite. And so that went so well that it started to catch. And so now CAMC is offering it. I know that um, uh, Marshall was aiming to start a program there. I'm pretty sure they have or are in the process of. Um, he got, Raleigh got a big card, like signed conference tablet by the paper signed by all like the, first, like the group that have one year plus sobriety from Cabin Creek. So, I mean, it's, it, it took off. I mean, it, and so it, it, and then I heard that Martinsburg, uh, the Martinsburg WVU medical campus is, is starting. They have a team going up there pretty regularly right now. And um, so, so it's growing. And so fewer people are having to travel so far, but can you imagine? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it was all there was.
get his Suboxone number and open shop. And that's what was happening. And so, you know, um, so you had physicians that knew nothing about addiction, you know, handing it out like candy basically and patting the addict on their head and saying, be a good addict and on your, on your way, you know. So, um, so that's the unfortunate piece because, um, you know, my husband always said like this, this was a gift to the first time my patients went back. Has this being used anywhere like outside of the WV medicine umbrella? So mm -hmm. there are clinics that aren't under our jurisdiction, basically. So Cabin Creek is not under our jurisdiction. Okay, it's not under us. No, no, it's not. And so other ones that are following this model, I think, are still under, under the WV umbrella. I will tell you that um, there were folks from across the country that were coming to observe uh, the code model and still do. Um, and so I do know it's in Kentucky. I know it's in Tennessee. I know it's in um, uh, Wyoming, it's in Indiana, it's in Pennsylvania. Because um, he would just, you know, people would call asking, you know, about like, how, like, what are you doing? How are you doing this? And he'd be like, just have a look. Like, you're not, like, like my words to you are not going to really do it justice. Like, it's just not um, something that you can just listen to without really appreciating just how, how it works. And so he would just invite people to come and observe. And so they did. And so then he was consulting people from across the country. And so the WVU is still supporting that effort too from a capacity building standpoint. And so Dr. Jim Barry is the gentleman, he was uh, Raleigh's protege for a number of years. And he now is the director of addiction medicine. And he's now the vice chair to on, you know, Bill Bravo's shoes. And he's doing a tremendous job really just trying to continue to to continue that bank and, and um, build capacity. And really, and, and also, you know, from a, a policy making standpoint too, is like, how can we prevent the, the cash cow shops, you know, from doing what they, they're doing. And so there, there, there is legislation now that's preventing more, you know, that, that is in the works. Probably was a part of the rulemaking process at that time. So they probably have those rules written by now. And so there are, um, you know, like if you are going to provide a medication assisted treatment uh, program, then you have to have A, B, C, D, and E legislatively. So well, a lot of the badness is, 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 is turning. Is the Suboxone, is that like addictive too? Like do people get addicted to that or is it just like, can you explain a little bit more? No, yeah. Like, so it's, so it's both an agonist and an antagonist. And so, um, so let me use my little cheat sheet because this is where he would have laughed at me one time. It's just a little bump on his butter. Okay, so you have methadone that tricks the brain into thinking it's still getting the, the abused drug. Okay, the person is not getting a high from it and it, it feels normal, so it, withdrawal doesn't occur. Okay, buprenorphine, like methadone, suppresses and reduces the craving. For the, for the abused drug, and it can come in a pill form, a tablet, like a, a film that you would place under your tongue, and um, there's, oh, now you can have an injection that'll last, I think, a year or two. They just started that, the folks in Kentucky that are, are What's the name of that? I can't remember now. Okay. Raleigh and I just attended the gals that he consulted at, at UK came last spring. And did a t our summer and did a talk okay. on their research study about the implant. Okay. And I, let me email that to you, then you can send it on the listserv because sure. you can look it up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so basically, um, it's a agonist and antagonist. Okay. And so the, the chemistry of it in the brain does prevent the cravings. And if you were to take it, and Take an opioid, you're not going to get high. Does that make sense? And um, what's interesting, though, is dosage-wise, is that there, you know, physicians that are ignorant to buprenorphine and how well it works at low dosage, at doses, is, you know, they were prescribing like 20 and 30, not like milligram doses, where really no one needs to be on any more than 12. 
and some might need 18 based on their use history. But anything more than that is when they're diverting it and selling it parts of it because you just don't need more than that. In fact, if you take more, you end up going in withdrawal. I put you in withdrawal. Uh -huh. Was there a question overdoses once the doctor came? People are taking it and it keeps getting the high. What do you think more? You mean while taking the buprenorphine? Yes. No, I don't. I don't think there was as much of an upswing in overdoses because of that piece as much as when people would lay off of it and become opioid naive. They would go right back to what they used before, and that's what's leading to a lot of the overdoses. Is that people end up clinging for a spell, and then they become their bodies and their brains become opioid naive, right. and then they end up going right back to the same amount that they were injecting or taking, and their bodies can't cope with that. And so that's where a lot of the overdoses come from. Unintentionally. And that seems to be something that we. Oh, yeah. Back in the old days, it was like, I mean, that used to be something people said, oh, yeah, I went into treatment so I could get clean so that my high would be cheaper. And it just, that's so they would use less. It's like, I can still get the same high, but I, because I've been clean for a little while, I can use, it won't cost me as much. Yeah. And it just seems like now they don't do that. They go into the 28 day program, they go out, they're clean for a while, then they use get the same amount they used prior to right. going in. And then they die. And for some reason, it's like. Well, but it's the nature of the of the substance. I mean, comparatively, like the old days that you're referring to were different drugs. That's true. I mean, I mean, this is this is profound chemistry. Yeah. I what, mean, what do you do though? I mean, because I just keep getting hit all the time with that. Anything medically assisted, except for the one that oh, is I'm just really you that up. the blocker. Um, you're just getting them addicted. Something else. Right. Okay. So the reason why that's intellectually false, okay, like that's just an intellectually untrue statement. If you see addiction for what it is, and it is a chronic disease of the brain, okay, if you understand that addiction is not a moral defect or a quote unquote weakness on the human part, okay. Because it's the people from that philosophy that say that. Yeah. Okay. So I've been hearing it from some pretty loud knowledgeable people in the medical community. Right. And mm -hmm. like physicians that even psychiatrists that were not trained in, in addiction see it that way. That you know, the 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 person struggling with substance use disorder is the only is it's probably the only um disliked patient. And most people who are ignorant, including physicians, to addiction for the disease that it is, easily get concerned that things like buprenorphine is a drug replacing another, replacing another drug. When, and so when I say that it's an intellectually dishonest statement, I say that because if you see it as a chronic disease, which in 2018, if you read enough, you know that it is. Okay, if you, if you read enough about the brain, you know that it is. Okay, it, addiction alters the reward center of the brain permanently. Okay, so if you see it for what it is, then to say that giving someone medication to treat a chronic disease would be poor practice is on its head because that's like telling someone who was recently diagnosed with diabetes that has now been on a course of injectable uh, insulin or metformin or whatever and their and their numbers are finally where they need to be to be healthy and happy and at risk and at less risk for death or other issues that come from diabetes when they were finally managed, would you tell them to stop? Would you tell them to stop their insulin? To treat 
treat their chronic disease of diabetes? Huh? Oh, no, okay, a little different. I know you're saying. <laughs> I get what you're saying. I mean, I, I, I love to hear. I've been to, I've been, I used to work at rehab. I've been to NA meetings and they wouldn't let people in that just spot me. So, like, they wouldn't come in. I've and been that, to NA meetings and they wouldn't let people like that in. That right, and that's, and that's philosophy, and yeah. that's fine. And people, the only people who are entitled to that opinion are the people who have struggled it themselves, as far as I'm concerned. We had the people that ran the meetings that wouldn't let Right, them they wouldn't let them in. Yeah. Okay? And and it's unfortunate yeah. because they're not helpful. They're not helpful to, to their brothers and sisters who are trying to recover. They're just recovering differently. You know, so I, I it's a huge, it's a huge, 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 hugely controversial topic in within the addiction community. I mean it's it, I mean within. So these NA and and, and AA groups there are some who absolutely will not let you in if you are, are on medication assisted treatment. And I think that's really unfortunate that they're entitled to their own rules and regulations. But it is a chronic disease. People recover from their chronic disease differently and maintain stability differently. And I'm not sure who is in the position to decide what's right or wrong. But I can tell you that if you had high blood pressure, and you were at risk for stroke, or heart attack, or all of the other things that come in between, and you were given medication by your doctor to manage your high blood pressure, and it was finally managed, and you were in a safe zone, and you're not going to cost the system more by ignoring it, because that's what happens, right? You're a bigger burden to the healthcare system if you ignore your health issues. So blood pressure finally stabilized, finally at lesser risk for dropping dead, and now we're going to tell you to stop it. Because I mean, why? Why take an extra pill if you're okay right now? I mean, do you see? Like, do you like from a chronic disease model? Why would you? Why would you keep someone from taking medication that virtually saves their life? Or to take the analogy a little bit further, there are people who get diagnosed with pre-diabetes or high blood pressure, and they are able to make some life changes and not need medication. Right, right. And, and that's, that's the same. That's a very good point, too. But just because this person can do it doesn't, doesn't mean, the mean person. this person can. And so that takes it a little further too. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people go into this program saying, "Now I want, I, I don't want to be on it forever. I want, to, I want, I want help. I want stabilized, and then I want weaned off." And Raleigh always supported that. And he would tell them, "I will, I will do whatever you ask, okay, but I do not require it." You know. And so he has patients that have been taking buprenorphine, physicians lawyers, coal miners, nurses, social workers, cooks, garbage men. I mean, he's that have been sober since 2000 and have elected to stay on a minimal dose because it's what makes them feel safe. There are others, and he provides fair warning. Their, their chances for relapse are over 90%. Like I would be, I would be neglecting you as a patient if I didn't tell you the facts. To wean you off could lead you to relapse. More likely than not, but I will do what you ask. If you do not want to be on this for a sustained period of time, we will wean you off. And he has tapered many people off. And there have been some people who have successfully abstained from opioids and every other drug since. And then there are others who just can't. Is there any repercussions um, of being on this like drug? Like, say, if you have a random drug screen and it shows up in your system, there's nothing an employer can do against you. That is not if it's prescribed. Okay, uh, that's what I was making sure. Not if it's and prescribed. you have to screen if it's prescribed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, not if it's prescribed. Okay. Does it come up as just an opioid, right, when you screen? I don't know. I think it just I think it comes up as uh, 
I think when they, it's a partial accent and an accent, so I don't know what it looks like in the media. Because I think when they do, I know when we do drug screens in the ER, we just do opioids and alcohol and then everything else. But I don't think that buprenorphine would show up unless you were like specifically asking for it. Gotcha. So the odds that they would go into an employer and get, have that come up positive. Gotcha. Thank you so much. This is not um, like a difficult property to do this drugs are there negative side effects like what are the actual drugs that? uh for the suboxone i mean i there were some that um experienced dry mouth i believe and there were some who not very many but i think i think there were some who from the like the film like the, the dissolvable tablet um some people were not able to take that without some sort of reaction um but he always encouraged people to try the film when it came out on the market, uh, and they still do today. Uh, encourage people to try the film because there's something about like the psychology of popping another pill, right? And so there was something about like kind of changing the pattern by using the film. But I do re I do know that there were some who were not able to take the film for some kind of reactionary standpoint. I don't remember what that was, uh, but in terms of major side effects. So if somebody can for like two particular drugs and side effects, like other treatment drugs with other different addictions, there are negative side effects. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, 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 that's, I think one of the good factors is that I do think dry mouth is one. It's pretty common. Like, like, no, no. Right. Dry no. mouth is a lot better than, you know, overdose. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if there were any other side effects, they must have been hit and miss because I don't ever remember.
I would wager, I guess, with the, with the PN treatment, this is the box one? Um, or was he getting it off the street? Uh, no, he was in treatment. And then uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't let him in a uh, meeting. So he, and then he relapsed shortly really after that. So he finally went cold turkey and everything. Got a sponsor. And, uh, he came like, uh, he's, had, he's, been, he's in Charleston. So he's been clean probably now, I think, four and a half years. Like, for city of Charleston. And then they wouldn't, and this goes across like all, all issues, mental health, mental health issues. And I'm just always saying, you know, we all got here in a different way, right. and everybody's way out is going to be different. Absolutely. Different and there's a lot, like, you know, for opioid dependency, met, like, there, like methadone has worked for a lot of people, buprenorphine works for a lot of people, naltrexone works for a lot of people. And he, like here, though, where they saw the most success was with the people. Um, the naltrexone, not so much. The methadone, not so much. So, again, I mean, but you know, that there are a lot of people who are doing great on these other ones. There are a lot of people who are doing great just haven't walked away from it. You know, but you know, this whole thing, like, why are we, why are we prescribing medication to help someone recover, is just a really ignorant question that is really couched in judgment. And as long as people are willing to be honest about that, you know, like yeah, I judge it. I think it's, I think, I think it's, it's morally incorrect to treat someone who wants to recover from an, an addiction with medication. That is an honest statement that I can live with because everyone's entitled to their opinion. But to say it's replacing one drug for another, knowing what the addiction journey and the recovery journey looks like is factually untrue. And from a, a chronic disease model, I mean, it's just scientifically untrue. I wanted to make one comment about the 12 step piece too. Is okay. that, you know, there are other there are other community support groups like Smart Recovery that folks mm -hmm. can go to that are different options that, that are have open. That same, yeah. You know, stipulation. So if somebody's stuck again, stuck with that. With that, that yes. That they have options, and then there are some groups that are just totally open, and yeah, you know, that's true. And uh, so the folks that are in the co program locally, like, are aware of who, right. you know, or which groups are more open than others, and you know, everybody's entitled to their thoughts and their opinions. But from a healthcare standpoint, it's really hard to, to buy into the replacing one drug for another. We are going to have to wrap up for today. Okay. Thank you, Dolly, so okay. much. That was a uh, really terrific presentation and really good discussion and questions. So All right, good discussion. Yeah. I was going to say, if you wanted to email me the PowerPoint, well, I we are creating did. a public Dropbox so people can access the resources from me. Nice. So I will just post it to that I if that's okay to. with you. That's absolutely fine. Yeah, okay, great. And then what else did I owe you? There was an answer about something. Oh, the in implant injection for Suboxone. Oh, the implant. Yeah. yeah just, okay. I was just curious. Yes. Yeah, I'll get that for you. I can text to Barry. There's a lady here. Get back to you. Thanks for listening. Thank and, you. Uh, I have a tool that I have.